Thank you, worship team, for leading us today. Good to see you all. Have, have you ever, I had a question for you. Have any of you ever gotten on a horse for the first time anybody ever got on that horse? Anybody ever done that? Well, oh, quite a, more in this service than last service. Um, that can be interesting. First time a horse gets ridden. I've had the opportunity to do it three times, three different horses. Only one of those horses bucked a little bad, but it was interesting every time. Another question for some of you horse people. How many of you have ridden a horse in a parade? Some of you have? Yeah. That can also be interesting. I had, a, a number of years ago, I had a, a spirited, half Arab, half crazy horse. <laughs> and uh, I could tell you stories that would um, make it clear that he had uh, something loose up here. But uh, he was an adventure. And so one time I decided to ride him in the Birthed Parade. Hey, if you've never been to the Birthed Parade, it's worth going first Saturday of June. Even if you live in another town, come here. Thousands of people. It's really impressive. So we've often had floats from the church, as I think we're going to do this year, advertising our breakaway camp. And so one guy and I, we decided to ride horses in front of the Grace Place float, one of us holding the, the American flag, one holding the Christian flag. And uh, <clears throat> we got, we we're at our old building um, over there past the fire department, and we were in the parking lot where the horse trailers were, and someone brought me the flag. And that's where the fun started. Because that horse didn't want that flag anywhere near him, and he could see it out of the corner of his, his, his eye. And so we went sideways across the whole parking lot until he finally realized it wasn't going to hurt him. And then we came out onto the main street and coming this way, and it was bedlam. People everywhere taking pictures, shouting, kid, throwing ca candy to kids, and, and he's just doing this, and, and his eyes are big. And I'm like, ooh, I don't know if this is a good idea. So we get to the railroad tracks. And there's no way he's going to go over those railroad tracks. And he just kept backing up and looking at it. He didn't know if it was a hole or a snake or I don't know what he was thinking. And uh, for a while there, I was like, man, he, well, I'm going to get him over these tracks. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold up this whole parade. So I just kicked him. And he reared up and vaulted through the air and <laughs> got back on four feet on the other side of the railroad tracks. <laughs> that was an adventure. And uh, with that in mind, I've always wondered if Jesus had any rodeo action when he hopped on a young donkey colt that had never been ridden. And more than that, he rode that colt through a parade full of thousands of people making noise and waving palm branches and throwing their coats down in front of the road in front of him. Today is Palm Sunday. <laughs> and this story of the triumphal entry is recorded in all four Gospels, and it kicks off Holy Week. So I want to take you there briefly at the beginning of this message to Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 3. It says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. I don't know if you've ever been to Israel, but from the top of the Mount of Olives, it's a spectacular view of the city. And uh, some of us have stood there together. Hopefully, things will, there will be peace there soon, and we can plan another trip, and, and some of us will go again. But when you're up there on the top of the Mount of Olives, you're looking at the whole city, you can see the, the foundation of the, of the original temple, which is no longer there, the Dome of the Rock, the second most holy place for the Muslim tradition is there. And, but it's just a spectacular view, and you can walk down. You can go all the way down to the Garden of Gethsemane through the Kidron Valley into the city. It's, it's really beautiful, and that's where this happened. I've walked down there several times, never ridden a donkey, but I did re ride a camel once down. <laughs> that's another story. So verse 4 says, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Now he's going to quote from the Old Testament, as we now call it. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now why did Jesus make this triumphal entry a week before the cross, riding on a donkey? Well, 
Matthew tells us right there, first of all, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. Zechariah 9, 9, he quotes, indicated that the coming Messiah was going to do this, was going to ride a donkey into the city. And by the way, when you read Matthew's account, each one of the gospel writers writes uh, from a different perspective and for a different audience. So Matthew primarily is writing for Jews. And you will notice that he over and over quotes from the scriptures that they trusted. And he will say, this was to fulfill what was written by the prophets. He says that over and over and over, including here. And so we see Jesus fulfills a prophecy riding a donkey. But notice also, the prophecy said he was coming gentle and riding a donkey. Now, uh, uh, some, some of you horse people might be wondering, why did he pick a donkey to ride? Why didn't he pick a horse? In those days, donkeys were viewed very differently than today. You might look at them as sort of cute and goofy. But they were considered in those days a sign of peace. If a king rode a donkey, it gave a message that he was coming in peace. If he rode a prancing horse, it means he's going to war. Verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. That's where we get the, the name Palm Sunday because they were, they were waving palm branches and putting them down like, so this donkey would have uh, like a royal carpet to walk on. And by the way, if you go back to the Old Testament, there, there, you find that there were examples of this being a customary way to treat a king. Especially when a king was being anointed as a new king, they would lay down clothes and so forth in front of, of the procession. So what these folks are indicating is that they are willing and they are ready and they are eager to accept Christ, Jesus, as the Messiah. According to their understanding and their hope for what they thought would be a political deliverer. They were eager to declare him king of the Jews and set him up as a new king on the throne, literally, in Jerusalem. And so the crowds would have probably preferred to have seen Jesus on a white stallion. That would have fit their image better of what they were hoping for and expecting in the Messiah. But Jesus here is intentionally breaking stereotypes. He's trying to communicate that the first time he comes, he comes as a suffering servant to purchase our redemption. He comes to bring peace on a donkey. Keep in mind though, he is coming again. He promised, all the promises that point into his first coming were fulfilled, and so will the promises that point to his second coming, which is still future. And when he comes the second time, it will be different. The day will come when he rides the white horse, and he comes to bring justice and to judge the earth and to cleanse the earth, and, and there'll be no more donkey riding then. <laughs> Look at this imagery from Revelation 19, 11, and 16. John says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. Verse 16, it says, on his robe and on his thigh. Did you know Jesus has a tattoo? <laughs> so I just throw that in there. On his robe and on his thigh, he has... This name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah. Looking forward to that day. The crowd with Jesus on the road were actually hoping for that day. <laughs> they were confused. They wanted that kind of white horse action. And in verse 9, the crowds went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The word Hosanna means literally, save now. And so they weren't just praising him with that word, they were appealing to him to act, to step up, to be what they hoped the Messiah would be. Save now, do it, we're behind you. The words they shout and quote here are from Psalm 118, and they were commonly used in times of worship, especially for the festivals, such as the Feast of Tabernacles and the Passover. But they come from an extended passage. If you read the whole thing in Psalm 118 and, and, and on both sides, it, 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 it is filled with prophecies of the coming Messiah. 
And so they knew what they were saying. They were declaring that he was who God had promised that he would send. He was the son of David, ready to restore the kingdom of David. And their hope was that he would do that literally physically right then and kick the Romans out of town and then reign as their king. Well, Jesus was coming to save them, but they were not prepared for how he was going to save them. They didn't want to know the truth at that point because they had a different anticipation, but he was coming to enter that city to suffer and die. This Friday and this Sunday, he, the grave is empty. We're in Holy Week. The triumphal entry signals the beginning of Passion Week. This is sacred time in history. It's not the same every time, every year on the calendar because we follow the Jewish calendar to set this up, which is about the moon and the full moon. And, the, and you can study about that if you're interested, but it, it can go very early, about a week earlier than this, week, this year. And it can go very late in, in um, April, but it's different every year. And today it's this week, this year, it's, it's March 31st next week. I want to invite you to this week to think deeply about the events of this week. The gospel writers all slow down after the triumphal entry. They, they, there's a lot more content about that last week than anything else in, in the life of Jesus. And rightly so, because of the significance. And I would encourage you in your devotional time, if you do that during the week, to you know, get out your Bible and read some of the last chapters of all four gospels and reflect on what happened in history for you this week. And then, if you'd like, come on Friday night. We're going to do a Good Friday service here. We're going to be in the round. It's going to be meaningful and reflective. We're going to read some scriptures about what happened on Good Friday and why it's Good Friday and sing some songs. It'll be one hour on Friday. And then on Easter, the big celebration, he's alive. There's going to be five services here. And that's because we, just, we found out the last couple of years we need that many to accommodate all the people that will come. And so it's going to start very early. You can call it a sunrise service if you want, even though it's happening in here. 7 o'clock, 8.15, 9.30, 10.45, and 12. And it's all on the website. And uh, what we have noticed is prime time is 9.30 and 10.45. And so we get slammed and people end up in overflow if they come late, which is not an ideal experience. And so here, I'd just like to appeal to you, if you're, if you're a, f- a regular faithful person here at Grace Place, and this is your church, and you can't find anybody to invite to come with you, try that, please. Pray about it. Try to invite somebody. It's a great time to invite. Consider coming to one of the first services, 7 or 8.15. And by the way, I believe you're going to get free burritos if you come at 7.00. Maybe at 8.15 if, there's, if they're not gone. It'll give me a donut wall at every service, so you, you'll have a treat. Or at noon, because those 9.30 and 10.45 are going to be slammed. And here's the deal. This is just me encouraging you. You do what you want. You will anyway. But <laughs> uh, um, if, you, if you invite someone and they say yes, and there's a good chance of that at Easter, Go to whatever service they prefer, okay? <laughs> if you can't find anybody, consider um, the others. Now, here we are, beginning Holy Week, Palm Sunday, and we just read what they were crying out to God. Yeah, I think they were praying to God, not just, crying, not just praising Jesus, when they said, Hosanna, save now, son of David. Notice they're praising Jesus and calling him son of David. I thought his dad's name was Joseph. Why are they saying that? Well, because they are hopeful that he is indeed the Messiah and they know the promises of the Old Testament, as we now call it, the Hebrew scriptures. They know the promises. And so what they're doing is they're calling for God to keep his promise. Save now, son of David. How valuable is a promise? guess that all depends on who's making the promise and how committed they are to it. Last week, I had the privilege to stand in, in front of a couple, young couple, committing their lives together in marriage. And I read these words as the chosen vows of love and commitment that we, we chose together. I promise to give you the best of myself and to ask of you no more than you can give. If you're sitting with your spouse, 
you know, renew your vows as we go through these. I promise to respect you as your own person and to realize that your interests, desires, and needs are no less important than my own. I promise to share with you my time and my attention and to bring joy, strength, and imagination into our relationship. I promise to keep myself open to you, to let you see through the window of my world into my innermost fears and feelings, hopes, and dreams. I promise to grow along with you, to be willing to face changes in order to keep our relationship alive and exciting. I promise to keep God at the center and focus, our relation, and focus of our relationship, relying upon his power to strengthen us. I promise to love you in good times and in bad with all I have to give, allowing God's grace to fill my heart and overflow to you completely and forever. And then it comes time for the I do's and the exchange of rings. Now, did you notice a reoccurring phrase in those vows? I promise. Are those just words or does a promise mean something? Well, obviously for some people, they're just words, it appears. Uh, for others, it becomes very difficult to, if not impossible, to stick with that promise because perhaps another partner's unwillingness or unfaithfulness or whatever, those situations happen. But still, there are others who make a covenant before God and to each other, which is God's intention. It is a sealed pledge, a till death do us part commitment. And those those couples discover that there is power in a promise being made and kept. Now, sometimes when I'm talking to couples, young couples, a lot of times, if I don't know them and they want a wedding, I don't do as many weddings anymore because I got a team and we share that responsibility. But in a lot of them over the years, and I've seen all kinds of different attitudes. And sometimes I'll just kind of level set expectations before I even commit and say something like, you know, is this marriage thing, is it just an option to try for a while? Um, is it a casual thing? Is it something you don't really want to talk about God in the ceremony? Because if, if so, please don't involve me in the process. You know, go, go to a justice of the peace or someone else. It, heck, in, Amer in Colorado, you can marry yourself. Did you know that? <laughs> Some, some states, you have to be credentialed, you know, it has to be on record with the courthouse. Not here. This is the Wild West. So, you know, if, if you don't want what I bring, please don't ask me to be there, okay? Because I, I I've been to some of those kind and I don't want to go back. But if you really want a pastor involved, and, and by that choice, you're saying that you want God and the church to be a part of your covenant, then make sure that you are counting the cost and you're ready to make a promise, a lifelong commitment. There's power in a promise. Never underestimate the power of a promise, especially when God makes the promise. God has made a series of covenant promises and he made a covenant promise to David, King David, in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And we are, we are concluding a series on David's life, lessons that we've gleaned uh, over the first three months of this year. We've been in First and Second Samuel. I hope it's been meaningful to you if you've been coming regularly. It has been to me as I've been studying and preparing for these messages. And there's so much more in there, but I think we've done a pretty good overview. And today I want you to consider what's going on here in Second Samuel 7. After God made a promise to David, David prayed this in verse 25. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promised so that your name will be great forever. Then people will say, the Lord Almighty is God over Israel. And the house of your servant David will be established in your sight. Now, another word that the scripture uses to describe God's promises to his people is that word covenant. And because God loves us, he loves his people, he loves all people. He wants to a relationship with as many as who will willingly choose and accept his gifts of, of salvation. And, and therefore he's made various covenants with his people throughout salvation history, all prefiguring and leading up to the final fulfillment in Christ, who brought the new covenant, okay? God made a covenant with King David that was an extension of the other relational covenants 
that he made previously. And, and, and here's a list of covenants that, that built on each other and pointed forward. First, there's what scholars like to call the Edenic covenant. And that was made in the Garden of Eden after sin when God told Adam and Eve that there was going to be a descendant of theirs that was going to be born, that was going to crush the head of the serpent of, of Satan. That was the first prophecy of Jesus. And then there's the Noahic covenant, a promise made with the whole earth where God said, I'm not going to destroy the earth again with a flood. And every time you see a rainbow, remember that. And I would encourage you, whenever you see a rainbow, just thank God. Just say, thank you for keeping your promise, God. I trust you. Then there's the Abrahamic covenant. And to Abraham, the father of Israel, uh, God gave a promise of descendants, of land, and of a seed, a descendant, singular, who would come and be a blessing to the whole world. And, and in Galatians, Paul points out that, that that word was singular because it was not just talking about any of his children. It was talking about one of his children. It was talking about Jesus Christ, who became human. And then there was the Mosaic Covenant at Mount Sinai with the people of Israel, a law-based covenant, a temporary teaching covenant. It had 613 laws, and there were blessings and curses associated with it, whether you kept the covenant or didn't. And it was temporary in that it was never intended to be salvation for people, but to be um, showing the holiness of God, the sinfulness of humanity, and the desperate need for a savior. And then the Davidic covenant, which we're looking at today. The promise of a son who reigns forever. God gave David a bunch of promises, but, but the most significant was the one that, that points to Jesus. Each of these covenants in one form or another was pointing to the full and final covenant fulfillment in Jesus Christ who ratified the new covenant by his blood shed for us this Friday on the cross. Now the covenant that, that God made with King David See it as an extension of the, especially the Edenic and the Abrahamic covenants. And a part of what God talks about from beginning to end as his everlasting covenant, the, the overarching covenant of grace that all of this falls under. And David got it because in 2 Samuel 23, 5, he said, has he not made with me an everlasting covenant? When we said that, he was referring back to the promises given here in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And when, 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 when 2 Samuel 7 begins, the king is in his palace, the land is at peace, he's feeling comfortable, and he, he thinks of something. He calls his buddy in, Nathan, the prophet who confronted him when he uh, had committed adultery with Bathsheba, also became a close friend of his. He might even have named one of his boys who was called Nathan after him. He was a counselor. He was an advisor that he trusted. And so he says to Nathan, hey, Nathan, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. He said, something's not right. I got a beautiful house. God doesn't. I want to build him a temple. This was very consistent with the nations around them who would build temples to all kinds of so-called gods. But David says, I want to build him a temple. I wanted something honorable. For the, to put his, the representation of his presence, the Ark of the Covenant, in there. Chapter before talks about him bringing the Ark back and all the uh, drama that was associated with that. We looked at that earlier. And so Nathan says, go for it. You want to do it? Do it. Do whatever you want to do. Good for you. Until that night when God speaks to the prophet and says, I got a message for David for you to deliver. And so he goes to David and he says, hey, I misspoke. God doesn't want you to build that house. First of all, God says he doesn't need a house. Furthermore, as we see later in the story, uh, you're, a, you're, you're a man of bloodshed. It's your son's going to build it, not you. But what he says is interesting. He says, you want to build a house for God? God says, no, I'm going to build a house for you. It's not going to be a house of mortar and brick. It's going to be a house of dynasty. And so God makes a series of promises. First, to make David's name great. Verse nine, I have been with you wherever you have gone. I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great like the names of the greatest men on earth. Certainly that came true. We've been talking about him for three months. Thousands of years later, 3,000 years later. 
Second, God said, I'm going to provide a land for my people. Verse 10, I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Next, to give rest from enemies. Wicked people, verse 10, will oppress them, will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. And then he says, to establish a kingdom. He promised. Verse 16, your house and your kingdom will endure how long? Forever. Forever. Before me. Your throne will be established for how long? Forever. Forever. David wanted to build a house for God. And God said, no, I'm going to build you a house. And it is going to be a kingdom that will endure forever. That word, forever, shows that these promises go far beyond the immediate descendant, Solomon, who did build the first temple that was later destroyed and then built again and destroyed again. Now, the high point of the covenant is the promise that pointed forward to the coming Messiah. Verse 12 and 13. God says through the prophet, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, the word forever is a key here because it shows that this promise transcended David's immediate son, Solomon, who would build the temple and pointed to the ultimate son, the ultimate coming Messiah, Christ. And in Christ, two houses converge. You see, when when Solomon built a temple, it didn't last. But when Jesus arrived... He said, one greater than the temple is here. Jesus himself fulfilled the temple. He's a better temple. His very body, crucified and risen, is the one meeting house where we can encounter God by faith. And as for the house of David, the ultimate chosen offspring from his royal line was none other than Christ himself. David wanted to build the Lord a physical temple, but from his lineage came the true temple of God incarnate. And the prophets later pick up on this idea and they speak repeatedly of this coming David, this new David, the son of David, who would be his descendant, who would be born in his his town, Bethlehem, and who would someday sit on his throne and reign as king forever. So many examples could be given. Let me just give you a a few. Uh, In Isaiah chapter six, there's a, or chapter nine, there's a verse I bet you every one of you have heard whether you've ever read Isaiah or not because it's such a popular Christmas verse. It's a prophecy fulfilled in Jesus. It says in Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And if you know Handel's Messiah, you know the next words. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Can you hear that in your mind, in your head? Wonderful counselor, almighty God. I will not sing it for you. You can be glad of that. But we should also read the next verse, okay? Verse seven, it says this. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign where? On David's throne, over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Uh, Next page, Isaiah chapter 11, verses uh, 1 and 2. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. That's David's father, Jesse. A a descendant, a shoot, a branch. He's called a branch several times, by the way, uh, the, the Messiah. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Let's jump over to Jeremiah. One example there, Jeremiah 23, 5. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David's righteous branch. David, a righteous branch. This is the Messiah, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous savior. How about Ezekiel 37, 24? My servant David will be a king over them and they will all have one shepherd. This is a couple hundred years after the time of David, by the way. It's not talking about David literally. It's talking about his son. 
They, they, they and their children and their children's children will live there forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. Just a smattering of examples from Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel should be enough to show how strong this promise and hope was and why the crowds on Palm Sunday were crying out to God to fulfill his promise when they said, calling Jesus by this name, son of David. Did you know the very first line in the New Testament calls Jesus the son of David? Look at that, Matthew 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Now, why does Matthew start off like that? Well, Matthew is writing especially to Jews and they're really into genealogies. And he wants to show that Jesus is a fulfillment of prophecies that were given to both David and to Abraham. And so he counts down starting with Abraham. He doesn't even talk about anything before Abraham because the Jews didn't care about that. He starts with Abraham and counts down. I don't know if you've ever noticed the difference between the two genealogies, one in Matthew 1 and one in Luke 3. <clears throat> now, stay with me here. I'm kind of going a little deep on some of this, but it's, it's going to all come together for you. Matthew, writing to Jews, starts with Abraham and traces down to Joseph, the legal father of Jesus, which is what was important to the Jews. But Luke, in Luke 3, writing to Gentiles primarily, starts with Jesus and traces him all the way back to Adam, the son of God, the father of all humanity, which is more interesting to Gentiles. But it's, there's more than that. If you look closely at the two genealogies, they are different genealogies. They both trace through David, but through different sons of David. The legal genealogy of Joseph traces through King Solomon. But the Luke's gospel, which I believe is Mary's genealogy, traces through a different son of David named Nathan, perhaps after his friend Nathan the prophet. And some people see that and they think, man, this is a contradiction. I can't trust the Bible. Those are two different genealogies of Jesus. But there are so many apparent con contradictions that can be resolved with a little reflection and time and thought and, and study. And this is one of them, I believe. I believe it, it's easily re resolved when we recognize that Matthew showing the legal ancestry of Jesus through Joseph. Luke is revealing the biological ancestry of Jesus through the mother Mary. Somebody on the plaza asked me, how could that be? He was born of, a, she was a virgin. Well, yeah, she was. This was a miracle of the Holy Spirit. But he, he drew from her DNA to give Jesus actual humanity, okay? So this was his biological and his humanness, his biological ancestry of his mother Mary. And so Jesus was doubly the son of David. Both of his parents um, traced their line through David. David is, is, Jesus is called the son of David 17 times in the New Testament and 10 of them right here in Matthew. And I, I made a list of them. I'll just give you a few examples. We saw the genealogy. Then when the angel comes in Matthew 120 to talk to Joseph, he calls him Joseph, son of David. And then Matthew 927, two blind men following Jesus say, have mercy on us, son of David. And, and then there's a second story about two blind men who do the same thing later, which tells me the blind men could see better than the Pharisees and the scribes because they recognized him as a fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, Matthew 12, 23, all the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? Canaanite woman in Matthew 15, 22 cries out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed. Two more blind men, Matthew 20, 30. The crowd in in 2031, rebuked them and told the blind men to be quiet, and they just shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The triumphal entry we just read, Hosanna, to the son of David. Matthew 21, 15, the chief priests and teachers of the law got really indignant and angry because there were children in the temple court shouting out, Hosanna to the son of David. They probably heard their parents say it, and they, they were echoing it. And uh, Matthew 22, 42, who do you think, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? 
the son of David, they replied. And it continues, seven more examples in the New Testament. One being when the angel comes to Mary in Luke 132, he says about Jesus, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. One day, Jesus confounded the religious leaders, the scribes and Pharisees. He was good at that. He did that on more than one occasion. They liked to ask him questions and he would ask them questions back and they could never answer them. And so there's one place where it says from that day on, they quit asking <laughs> because he would just mystify them, confound them. They didn't know how to answer. And here's an example. He asked them to explain the meaning of this title, son of David. How could it be that the Messiah is the son of David when David in the Psalms calls him his Lord? How could he be his Lord and his son at the same time? <laughs> so Jesus says in Mark 12, 35, it says, while Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, and now he quotes Psalm 110, verse 1, which is quoted more than any other Old Testament verse in the New Testament. Incidentally, he quotes from Psalm 110. The Lord, this is David writing, he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Jesus then says, David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be son? Excuse me. So the teachers of the law couldn't answer. And, and Jesus here exposed their ineptitude as teachers and their ignorance, whether it was willful or otherwise, of the Old Testament, what it really taught, the true nature of the Messiah. And, and by doing so, he further alienated himself with them. But, but Jesus' point in this question in Mark 12, 35, is that the Messiah is more than just a physical son of David. If he's David's Lord, then he must be greater than David. He's both the creator of David and the descendant of David. Only the Son of God made flesh could say that. Back in the early days of the Christian history, uh, St. Augustine of Hippo was one of the best thinkers in the Christian church since Paul. And late fourth century into the fifth century, he was a bishop of, Hip, of Hippo. He had had a dramatic conversion and he, and he thought deeply about the things of God. And he wrote this, Christ is both David's son and David's Lord. David's Lord always, David's son in time. David's Lord, born of the substance of his heavenly father. David's son, born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Ghost. Unless our Lord Jesus Christ had vouchsafed, did you use that word this week? In case, unless our Lord Jesus Christ had vouchsafed to become man, man had perished. He was made that which he made, that what he made might not perish. Very man, very God, God and man, the whole Christ. The mission and ministry of Jesus was a fulfillment of a promise that God made 950 years earlier to David. And the, the early Christians recognized this quickly. Paul, in one of his sermons, said this, Acts 13, 22, he said, After God had removed Saul, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, after my heart, who will do all my will. From the offspring of this man, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus. So when the crowd surrounded Jesus on this day in history, on Palm Sunday, shouting out, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they were recognizing Jesus as the promised king, the Messiah. What about you? Have you recognized him for who he is? Not just savior, but also king. Did you know back in the early days of the founding of this nation that the, colo the colonialists, many of them wanted George Washington, who was our first president, to be actually our king. But he refused. Because 
George, along with many others, believed that there was only one king, <clears throat> and it was not the king of England. On April 22, 1774, before the Revolutionary War, a report was sent to the king of England, King George III, and in it, the governor of Boston exclaimed, if you ask an American who his master is, he will tell you he has none, nor any governor but Jesus Christ. In April 1775, when a British mayor called the colonialists villains and told them to lay down their arms in the name of George, the sovereign king of England, the immediate response was, we recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. And that became a battle cry, actually, and a motto of the Revolutionary War. No king but Jesus. I think it's still a good motto, don't you? You see, Jesus is not just a savior. Thank God that he is a savior. But he's also a king. What difference does that make? What does that mean? How do we apply that? What encouragement do we take away from this today? Well, we can make a long list, but for now, I want you to think of this. Because he is king, we have a robust hope deep inside us. You see, our hope goes beyond our own personal salvation. It's a hope for the world. If he is just savior, individuals get saved. That's fine. But if he is king, then everything he has promised is going to happen. He's going to bring his headquarters literally, physically to this earth someday. And he's going to reign on this earth made new, renewed by his power and for his glory and with his people who will see his face. This is a hope that is, that is solid and is connected to his kingship. Our hope is not just an, an individual hope, but a corporate hope. This is the plot line of the scriptures. You begin at the Bible and God created a beautiful paradise, but everything got interrupted and infected by a virus called sin. And when Adam and Eve fell, things changed for this, this earth. We live in a broken, fallen world now. We won't forever, but we do now. And it's the only explanation sometimes for why bad things happen. I, I sat and listened with a grieving heart to a woman this week, young woman who lost her husband suddenly last year in a, in a tragic accident and is still wrestling with that. We wrestle with why. Why do these things happen in this? And the only answer many times is that it's a broken world. God promised a day of fairness is coming. And he's going to fix it all. But right now, it's a broken world. And we went together in my office to uh, Romans 8, which has helped me many times with this why question when bad things happen to good people. And it says there, all creation is groaning and waiting for the final renewal that God's promised. And until then, there's a lot of groaning. But God has, has a plan and he keeps his promises. We can count on it. The true king will make everything a paradise again. And so now... We enjoy our life, but are only shadows of what we will be. The, the king came the first time as promised, and he will keep his promise to come the second time and renew all things. Read the last two chapters of the Bible if you want to get excited. Yeah. Last two chapters of the Bible are all about how God plans to wrap everything up eventually and eliminate sin. Uh, that's in the chapter, the third chapter back, but the last two chapters, 21 and 22, just describe this, this merging of heaven and earth into one space here on earth renewed and God dwelling again with his people in the flesh. It says in chapter 22, the opening verses that uh, no longer will there be a curse. The throne of God and the lamb will be in the city and the servants will serve him. They will see his face. And his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light or a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Yeah. And then on the very last page of the Bible, verse 16, Jesus, it's red if you have a red letter edition. Jesus speaks and he says, I am the root. Remember we saw that in the prophecies? And the offspring, the son of David, and the bright morning star. He declares himself the fulfillment of all those prophecies. 
Isn't it interesting? The very first verse of the New Testament, the very last page of the New Testament, called Jesus the son of David. And as soon as Jesus declares himself as the Davidic king, he immediately turns as Messiah and king to make an appeal that's found in the next verse, verse 17. And if you are not a follower of Jesus yet, so glad you're here. Or if you've wandered away off the path somehow, maybe the Holy Spirit has you here today for a reason because he's calling you home. And I, I would hope that you would listen to these words from the mouth of Jesus and take them personally to you. It's an appeal. <clears throat> Verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. That's the heart of Jesus for you. And I pray and I hope that you will respond to his appeal. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for salvation history as we've had this big overview today. Thank you for keeping your promises. And we believe that because you kept your promise the first time, you're guaranteeing us you're gonna keep it, all your promises to the end. And we are grateful for that. And it, it gives us hope, a blessed hope, the Bible calls it, as we look forward to what you have in store for us. And Lord, if there's anyone here who's saying, you know, I feel like I'm kind of on the outside looking in. I haven't really surrendered my life to Jesus as Savior and King. I pray, that, I pray for that person or those persons right now that they would have the courage to just open up their heart right now to you and even quietly, you can hear our thoughts. Even quietly, just pray, Lord, I give up on trying to go my own way. I want to surrender my life to you as Savior and as King. And I confess that I have tried to quench the thirsty, my thirsty soul with the wrong things. And it's not quenching my thirst at a soul level. And so I want to take hold of this free gift of water of life that you offer anyone who is thirsty. And I want to come into right relationship with you. Thank you for forgiving my sins and accepting me as your child forever. And if you're making that, if you're praying that prayer right now, it's the most important prayer you can ever pray. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or come forward. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I am going to ask you to do is consider being baptized next Easter, next week on Easter. Go on our website and sign up and go public. Make it official before God, angels, and the witnesses that will be here cheering on you on. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and, and say amen. Would you stand as we close our service and sing? <clears throat>